This podcast is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more. Please leave a written review on whatever app you get this podcast from. Spoiler alert. When this podcast talks about Game of Thrones on HBO, it talks in the context of the most recently aired episode. And when it talks A Song of Ice and Fire books, it talks in the context of the most recently released book by George R. R. Martin. You've been warned. Dedicated to HBO's Game of Thrones and George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire book series, you're listening to Matt's audio blog, Game of Thrones. And now, here's your host, Matt Murdock. All right, and welcome back to Game of Thrones, Matt's audio blog. I'm Matt. Thanks for joining me. If it's your first time, welcome. If it's a many-time listener, welcome back. This is a podcast that looks at the story and the music of HBO's Game of Thrones, and somewhere down the line, we'll be looking at the stories of A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin as well. Uh, Still got a full plate of Game of Thrones episodes to get through before we start doing that. But I'm hoping that maybe, just maybe, by the time that we're done watching all of the seasons of Game of Thrones, maybe, just maybe, George R. R. Martin might have us some news about when Winds of Winter is going to come out, at least. Um, I do know that uh, in an upcoming couple of months, the, he will have the uh, the first of the Targaryen historical stuff coming out uh what is it fire and blood i don't remember right now anyway we'll be covering all of that stuff as well so if you're a book reader don't feel alienated if you're a tv show person don't feel alienated when we do the books either i always try to balance things as much as i can because they have become really two different kinds of stories anyway that's a lot of talking, but mattsaudioblog.com is where you can find all of the back episodes that we've talked about in terms of the past episodes of Game of Thrones before. You can also find contact information like mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com. Or you can tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter, M-A-T-T-S G-O-T blog on Twitter. And if you do so in the next, well, let's see, this is coming out on the Thursday. So uh, 24 to 36 hours you still have to submit feedback for season three to make it into the podcast that will come out on Monday of next week. Now, if you're stumbling on this podcast in 2019, I can't help you. You kind of miss the window, but if you're getting this podcast right as it comes out, you have 24 to 36 hours to get me any season three feedback, and I'd love to hear it. Today, we're going to be covering the season finale, naturally. That's entitled Misa, season three, episode 10, Misa, written by David Benioff and Dan Weiss and directed by David Nutter. I think because of the way the spelling was when I saw it on IMDb, when I first covered this back for Podcast Winterfell, that I actually, even though everybody at the end of the episode was screaming, Misa, 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 for some reason, I looked at the spelling, which is M-H-Y-S-A, and I still wanted to pronounce it Misa. I mean, go figure. That's being obstinate, is it not? That's the mark of a true old man. But... Uh, it's still a great episode and I can't wait to talk about it with you. But on Thursdays, we do the music first and I'm going to get to that in just a second. But I also want to tell you that mattsaudioblog.com, that's M-A-T-T-S audioblog.com, is where you can find podcast app links. And if you are a person who is using a podcast app to listen to this podcast that allows for written reviews, please, please, please take the time to do so. That's what helps me get into the search engine so that we can build our community better. And I'm not asking for glowing reviews. I mean, if you have something bad to say, say it. I mean, if there's something that just really irks you about my show, I want to hear what that is because that helps me to keep everybody happy. But the only way I know if you're unhappy is if you tell me. Or the only way that I know what you're happy with specifically is if you tell me. And the best way to do that is through the written reviews on, say, like an iTunes or a Stitcher or whatever podcast app that allows for written reviews. I do understand that some of them don't. And that's perfectly fine. You do not have to worry about that. If you, say, are listening on an app that just there's no place to leave a written review, then by golly, 
you've done your bit by listening, and that's all I can ask of you. Uh, but if you are listening on iTunes or Stitcher, I mean, and there's something that really irks you or something you really like about the show, please leave a written review and let all of the rest of the potential listeners know what you like or dislike about this show, because that's what's going to help grow our community even bigger so that we can all watch season eight when it finally comes out sometime in 2019 We'll all be able to watch it together and we'll all be able to have a bigger collective of thoughts to share in regards to those episodes. Whew. A lot of talking, didn't I do? I did a lot of talking. Yes, a lot of talking. We need to get to talking about the music of this particular episode first since it is a Thursday and we will cover the music of Misa, Season 3, Episode 10, written by Benioff and Weiss, directed by David Nutter, and as always, scored by Ramin Javadi. We're going to talk about the music next, where I want to focus on not just how music can affect your emotions, but also how it can tell specific stories. That's next. An analysis of the music in HBO's Game of Thrones. It was all I had once. Before Marcella was born, I used to spend hours How long does it go on? Until we've dealt with all our enemies. And so we begin, and this is the scene between Cersei and Tyrion in this episode, where they're talking about how Cersei feels that Tyrion needs to give Sansa a child because that's the only kind of happiness that she'll truly find. And you may have heard this music and thought, well, that doesn't seem like much of any kind of thing that's telling a story, but it does. It's a very specific story. In fact, this theme, although there's a, a couple of additions at the end of this theme that weren't present when it, we, heard, was, we heard it before, this theme is very specific to Cersei talking about motherhood. And we've heard it, I know, at least one other time before. So we can technically call this an actual theme. I don't know whether you want to call it Cersei and motherhood, or if you would just want to call it a mother's love, or, or a mother's twisted love. I don't know. But whatever you want to call it, it is a theme. And this is the music that I'm talking about in terms of it being a theme. And like I just said, it is very specific in terms of its storytelling element because the other key time that we've heard this music before was back in season two, and I believe that was A Man Without Honor, where Cersei and Tyrion were once again talking about her children. Here's that. The Targaryens. Wed brother and sister for hundreds of years, I know. It's what Jamie and I would say to each other in our moments of doubt. It's what I told Ned Stark when he was stupid enough to confront me. (laughs) 
So not only is the music emotional because it's kind of minor, which makes it kind of sad, um, and it has these thick kind of chords to it, which makes it feel texturally complex, but it also is related to a specific thing regarding Cersei. The most remarkable thing is, is that this is the exact same circumstance even. It was Tyrion and Cersei talking about Joffrey and the children and back in season two. Here it is Tyrion and Cersei talking about children here in season three. So there's a lot of similarities in the scene and Ramin Javadi because the same kind of emotion is really coming out of Cersei here as it was in the scene from this episode. So both scenes from season two and season three, they make you understand that, that Cersei really does love her children. I mean, she may be twisted. She may be a little bit weird about the way she shows her love for her children, but she truly does love her children. And I absolutely love the fact that the almost the exact same kind of cue with just a couple of differences between the two um, told the same story because we were getting the same story again. Now, is that a comment on Dave and Dan not having material? I don't know. But it was a good acting moment for Peter Dinklage and Lena Headey. I do know that uh, in both cases. And so I'll take that any time. And of course, I will take Ramin's score for it as it was absolutely beautiful. The next thing that I want to use as an example of storytelling for the music is when Jon Snow is found by Ygritte. We've covered that theme this season already. It's called You Know Nothing. And I'm not going to do any kind of breakdown thing about it that's really all that different, except for this. At the beginning, when John first realizes that Ygritte is there and he tries to explain himself, there are elements of the theme within those static kind of chords. And they just kind of pop in and out. And it seems very muddled. And that is because... John is trying to explain why their love must die, even though he does love her. It's a muddled bunch of confusion. It's a real world of just crap that's been thrown in John and Ygritte's face. No matter how much they really care about each other, they cannot exist in the same place anymore. And so you get these kind of muddled, muddy kind of chords that lead up to Ygritte, who is so much for the absolute of the fact that they had to either be together or be completely enemies. That's when the theme then comes out and is at its fullest when she starts to shoot the arrows and John has to try and quickly get away on the horse. Here's that clip. You know, I didn't have a choice. You always knew who I was. What I am. That one gets me every time, every single time that one gets me because the viewpoints of John 
with the muddiness and everything and the viewpoint of Ygritte with the absoluteness tells the deeper side of the story as well as just being flat out emotional. And this time around with that kind of realization, I mean, I cried again. I, I know I cried the first time I saw this on, on TV. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a softie, folks. I, I am totally a softie. And I sometimes let the music overwhelm me to be upset or emotional about scenes that sometimes don't affect other people in the same way. Nonetheless, the realization of how Ramin's music was absolutely musically demonstrating each character and then the great acting of Kit Harrington and Rose Leslie, that's the beauty of film scoring is that it can be so diverse in its function. And here Ramin put two huge possible functions into the same cue and it just totally gets me. I've got one more clip that I want to show in this particular episode that demonstrates great storytelling by Ramin by the use of themes. And that is the scene after Davos has set Gendry free and he's been caught and Stannis starts to order his execution. What you get first is what I've called in the past the, the kind of Stannis accompaniment of the Lord of Light, which is this. And that's when he's ordering Davos's execution. Then Davos comes back with some words about how Stannis is going to need him because he has that scroll from, he has that raven from Maester Aemon. And as soon as they start reading the contents of that, you understand it because Ramin is telling you he's playing the theme for the White Walkers and for Up North of the Wall as Stannis and Melisandre are pondering the words that are on the piece of paper. This. And once Melisandre throws it into the fire and starts seeing things that she sees, not always correctly, but she basically saves Davos's life, and Stannis kind of makes fun of Davos because... Davos naturally hates the Lord of Light, but the Lord of Light has just saved him, and you get the Lord of Light theme. And it all is blended together so well. And one of the things that transitions from the White Walker theme to the Lord of Light theme is a really beautiful statement of the theme, but a slight change in harmony, like this. So the combination of those three and the sequence and the way that they transition together tells the story that's happening on the screen. Not just, oh, this is this character saying this or this is this character saying that, but it's actually Stannis' theme is telling us about his resoluteness. He's done with Davos and he's not, he doesn't even really want to change after Melisandre tells him that he can't, but he does naturally. Then you have the White Walker theme, which is telling us what's on the piece of paper. We don't need to know what's on the piece of paper. We don't need Melisandre to tell us that the dead are coming. I mean, naturally, we all know the dead are coming, but we hear that White Walker theme, and that tells the story of what's on the piece of paper. And then you have this wonderful transition as to how that ends up saving Davos's life, and we get that irony of the fact that Davos is being saved by the Lord of Light, and we hear the Lord of Light theme. It is a wonderful piece of musical storytelling. Not just supplementing emotion, but musical storytelling. And that's the clip I'm going to leave you with. We'll be talking about the story of Season 3, Episode 10, Misa, next. Very well, Sir Devas Seaworth. I, Stannis, of the House Baratheon, first in my name, rightful King of the Andals, and the first men sentenced you to die. I understand. But... It's from Meister Eamon of the Night's Watch. Their Lord Commander is dead.
This war of five kings means nothing. The true war lies to the north, my king. Death marches on the wall. The Davos. You've been saved by that fire god you like to mock. Man, that music just fires me up, man. I, I I'm really fired up today. I was so excited to do this particular segment about Rami Javadi's music. I guess I should add this as an afterthought is the fact that this episode opened with that same attack motive that I talked about in the last episode, the reigns of Castamere, that polyrhythm thing that dun, 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 that told us exactly what we needed to know. No, Sorry, kiddos. It was not a dream. This is real. This is happening. And that kind of brings me to my first subject of this episode, which is uh, Misa, Season 3, Episode 10, written by David Benioff and Dan Weiss and directed by David Nutter. But I always start with things that are on the surface. And it's interesting to me the parallel between the season finale of Season 1 and this season finale because both come on the heels of some surprise deaths, right? Nobody thought Ned's head was going to get cut off. I was hanging out with a bunch of guys from the DVR podcast network on a podcast called The Film List, having an emergency podcast because we couldn't believe that they'd cut Ned's head off. Boy, I knew nothing about this show back then. I sound really dumb, uh, but uh, check out The Film List. Perhaps you can uh, find that episode and laugh at me. Uh, you're probably laughing at me now. What am I talking about? N anyway, we didn't want to believe that Ned was dead, right? We we were hoping that it was some kind of trick, some kind of dream. And lo and behold, right at the opening of the season one finale, Ned's head gets held up. And then we later see it on a pike as well. But that was just horrendous. It's It's just telling you, nope, nope, you didn't imagine this. It actually happened. And that's the same thing that you get with that attack motive as Roos is climbing the stairs and he stands up on the ramparts as every soldier who might possibly be loyal to a Stark is just being slaughtered like sheep. It was awful. It's just awful feeling. Not only that, but there's a big parallel between Ned's head being held up and the fact that our poor Arya sees Rob with Grey Wind's head sewn to his body on that horse. There's a parallel there as well. And it's, again, reinforcing that same feeling. We're not imagining this. Darn it. It makes you so mad. It makes you so terrified. It makes you so sad. And these kind of emotions are the things that I talk about in the surface. Not necessarily thoughts from the head. Uh, I don't know what part of the body they come from, but they definitely don't come from the head, and they usually just spew out in a bunch of garbled mess when I talk about these kinds of things. But I absolutely just, the first time, because I had not read A Storm of Swords yet, I was just like, oh my God, what just happened at the end of Reigns of Castamere? And then I have to be reminded exactly what happened at the beginning of this episode, Misa. And uh, your heart breaks for Arya. I mean, that's the thing, is that the pain doesn't just culminate it accumulates. It goes exponentially because now not only do you have to bear the pain for yourself as a fan that this is real, but you also have to experience Arya's pain as well. And uh, the turn for her to from the beginning of this episode where this happens to her to where she ends up at the end of this episode, um, you can see why. Now, I'm not saying you can justify it, but I'm saying that you can see why this little girl does what she does at the end of this episode. 
We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Um, there are some other things in this particular episode that are very emotional for me. I covered one of them in the music part, and that's when Cersei and Tyrion are talking. Because if it's one thing that Dave and Dan have achieved for me, and I'm not saying that every fan's like this, but for me as a book reader and a TV show watcher, something that Dave and Dan have done for me is to feel for Cersei in a lot of ways, to feel sympathy for her, which is something that I don't feel George has ever truly achieved because George has characterized her in a slightly different way, not in a better way. I'm not saying that TV only people. I'm just saying in a different way that makes her less sympathetic or empathetic. And here with this conversation with Tyrion in combination with that season two scene, we covered both of those in the musical analysis. Um, it makes you understand uh, something deeper about Cersei that I think you can glean from the books that she loves her children, but you don't feel for her in the same way that you do in the television show. And part of that's Dave and Dan's writing, I guess. And part of that is Lena Headey's great acting. Regardless of that, it, it's still that, that scene that how, Cersei, the only thing that kept her alive was her children. That's sad, man. I mean, that's that's not petty or crazy or anything like we think of some of Cersei's actions. There's a real person in there somewhere. And that made me feel bad for Cersei. I also felt really bad for Tyrion when he was talking to Tywin. Uh, the, the whole logic of why the Red Wedding was happening and everything we can talk about in a little bit. But just the end of that scene where Tywin is so mad that he had to keep Tyrion around. And it's this constant back and forth. It's like, does Tywin believe in Tyrion? Does he give him, you know, props when props are due? Because he did send Tyrion to be the hand of the king for a while. And Tyrion got a taste of that and his own kind of greed about having that kind of power. And I'm not saying it's an evil greed, but it's just a natural kind of greed. You have that kind of power. You don't really want to give it up. And Tyrion's been trying to get back into that fold this whole season. And he's even done things that he never wanted to do, like marry Sansa in order to try and stay in the fold with his father. And now his father just throws this out there. I wanted to throw you in the ocean. I mean, that is a horrific thing for Tyrion to hear. And probably nothing that he doesn't already suspect. I mean, he's always thought of himself as a disappointment to his family. But I mean, that's just literal hatred coming out of there. And that destroyed me. And it makes you like Tywin a lot less, naturally. It also makes you like Tyrion a lot more. And I think it's probably a little bit on the extreme of either side of where we should be with it. Because Tywin, to me, actually is a very savvy character. And Tyrion, to me, is not nearly as perfect as Dave and Dan would like him to be. Let me let that sink in because I'm sure I'm going to get some emails about that at some point. And that's fine. I would love to hear your counterpoints for that. But uh, I do grow a little bit tired of how Dave and Dan use Tywin and Tyrion too much to reach for the hats. Get Tyrion up there to the white hat. Get Tywin up there to the black hat. When both were extremely, and, and, and it's demonstrated in this story as well. Don't get me wrong. The TV story has demonstrated that these two guys aren't just white hat and black hat. They are much more complex than that. But this scene seemed like such an extreme departure from what we'd heard Taiwan before. It also is really cool in the fact that it kind of maybe expressed, uh, repressed feelings that Tywin had had for many, many years. Uh, and he finally exploded with it. That's a very realistic human kind of thing as well. I mean, we've all probably said things that we regret saying. And the problem is, is that we never find out because of the way that T Tywin seems wishy-washy about Tyrion throughout the course of the series, uh, the rest of the series that he's in anyway, 
he's so kind of back and forth about everything that even when it comes to the final scene between the two of them, which was fantastic in season four, I still don't know which thing that Tywin's saying that I want to believe. Not that I actually do believe, but that I want to believe. If that makes any sense to you. And then, of course, <laughs> how do I put this one lightly? Uh, the idea that people have about certain characters in this show because they're not the heroic character or they're not the main character, so to speak, or because they have a little bit longer progression in terms of getting to where they're supposed to be ultimately. Uh, that really bothers me when people criticize that. Um, also, I'm open to it. You can argue with me for the day long as I draw my line in the sand about Sansa, about why I should not like her. And I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm saying that more, nine times out of ten, I'm going to lose a Sansa argument. But it's never going to make me stop loving her. Ever. And you can make fun of the sheep shift joke that's in this episode or not. I love the fact that they were starting to build a relationship and how this red wedding destroyed that. Yet you think about the strength of those two who just two episodes later, Sansa is picking up a chalice for Tyrion. She doesn't have to do that. She could have even kicked it further off of the stage. She didn't. She was there for her husband. And that was amazing. That's one of those things that actually make you maybe want to ship Tyrion and Sansa if you're into that kind of thing. I'm not. and It still seems really weird to me. Um, but if I had no choice but to have Tyrion and Sansa or to have Tyrion or Sansa try to kill each other, I would take the former, not the latter, because... Just in a few short episodes, in a great economy, they really demonstrated how a relationship can grow. The same way that evidently Catelyn and Ned's relationship had to grow. That's what Catelyn was trying to tell Rob this whole time. Instead of marrying Talissa, you can grow a relationship with this Frey girl. Now they're all dead. Oh, man, on the surface, I'm just on fire. And probably with a bunch of stuff where you're saying, shut up, Matt. I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, Tell me in a written review that way. Maybe I can do something about it in future podcasts. But until then, I'm just being a fan here. And it's, again, Sansa is one of those people that I have to draw the line in the sand about. So is Sam and Gilly. I loved Sam and Gilly in this episode. One of the biggest smiles on my face this time around. And it was because I had forgotten that this was the episode where she actually gave her baby Sam's name. But when that scene happened, I just smiled so wide, my heart filled with joy, and I absolutely loved Sam and Gilly in this particular episode. And I'm going to get more into them talking about Bran and all of that here in a minute. But all of that emotion is there. So I guess that's where I better stop in terms of the emotion. Because uh, like I said in the last podcast that I could have gone uh, the whole podcast just talking about on the surface stuff. Uh, but that's stuff that we all experienced before. I could maybe fill up two podcasts with emotional stuff in this one. So I'll just leave it to that and I'll try to get to my three big things. Three, three big things. And my first big thing is that Bran has gone north of the wall. Bran will never return from north of the wall. When he comes back in season seven, he is someone else. He is a collection of everyone. He tells Mira that he is no longer him. And just as Mira had prophesied in season four, he loses himself in being the three-eyed raven. So, this is the kind of thing that is huge on a rewatch that doesn't really mean anything other than, ooh, where are they going to go when you're watching it for the first time? But now, 
you realize that Bran has set foot south of the wall as himself for the very last time. It's kind of sad. It's kind of interesting. But at the same time, it's just huge in a lot of ways. He returns as some kind of super being in a lot of ways, as opposed to just a crippled boy. Not only that, but just the whole bit with Sam and Gilly meeting with them and telling us about the dragon glass and all of that stuff. That was fantastic as well. I, there was something that I noted in here um, that I'm not sure that I caught the first time around. I, I don't remember if anybody mentioned it the first time around in any of the podcasts that I was listening to, but Sam says someone buried the dragon glass a long time ago. And I remember at the time w during season two, when the dragon glass was first found, that some people were theorizing, well, maybe Benjen left it behind. And lo and behold, Benjen was still, well, I guess you'd say half alive. But if we're to believe Sam, and I don't know how Sam would know, but if we're to believe Sam, then it kind of throws away the idea that any one of the recent past left the dragon glass for anyone to find. Now, there were telltale signs that Theorists were, I guess, ignoring, which was like it was runes markings on the uh, on the stone that was covering the dragon glass. Wouldn't that tend to uh, like it was the mark of the first men? Wouldn't that tell you that it had been there for a long, long time? Um, that's probably the conclusion that Sam is coming to there. And I'm not sure if that's the writers trying to tell us, OK, yeah, you know, the dragon glass is not what you book readers think. It's not Benjen who left it there. And I don't know that a lot of book readers were thinking that. Um, but if they were, it sure got foiled. On the other hand, if you really want to draw your line in the sand about that theory, you can say, well, how would Sam know? Maybe somebody just found the rune rock and just put those under there. Maybe it was Benjen. Yeah, I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. I don't get into those kind of semantics. Uh, but I, I did find that interesting to catch this time around. It also made me realize that maybe I didn't talk enough about Bran and Rickon separating in the, w w was that the last episode that they separated? Because that was huge as well in a lot of ways. I walked away from this season watching it the first time thinking, okay, well, if Bran's going to go north of the wall, he may not survive. That means Rickon is the last male Stark. So Rick, there must be big plans for Rickon in this story somewhere down the line. Boy, was that wrong? Didn't even come back till season six. And then he came back for what an episode and a half. Was it even that? So, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking totally wrong in that respect. And, and that, really threw me this time around as well as I was watching this because I was thinking, okay, Brand's north of the wall. Brand's going to come back. So it doesn't really matter if Rickon uh, made it or not, but Brand doesn't really come back as himself. So Rickon really was still, even if, if he'd have survived the battle of the bastards, he still would have been the true heir in a lot of ways because Brand was no longer Bran. And that's exactly why Sansa, well, she's the oldest heir, so I guess that's why she actually has the place right now. But you could make the argument that it has to be a male heir, especially in this particular world. And so uh, Sansa would have to, I guess, uh, concede to that based on normal circumstances. But since Bran isn't Bran, well, she doesn't really have to do that. So those are some things about Bran going north of the wall. I do want to mention this, and I, I'll, I, I know that it's not really part of the same subject, but the ghost story about the rat cook and what Dave and Dan were trying to do was to show that it wasn't just the horror for us fans of seeing the Starks murdered, but that this was something 
that even goes beyond murder, I guess I should say, because it was the murdering of someone who was under guest rights. And that's something that you have to consider about with maybe Arya as well in season seven. Because wasn't everybody at Frey's party under guest rights as well? Or were they? I mean, it, it was a large party after all. Uh, and that's where you get the whole idea of why Tywin is trying to downplay his involvement with Tyrion as well. And I said in the last episode, I thought that Tywin made a pretty good argument. And under, I guess, real world circumstances, that argument still holds. In this episode, he makes the case of, would you rather kill 10,000 men or, or a few Starks at dinner? And the the point being that uh, it would save lives, ultimately. However, as Tyrion points out, people like Bran know why this was a terrible thing. And the people in the North who know the story of the rat cook, because they have old nans in their places telling them about this, you know, that's why Tyrion says the North will remember. And... <laughs> Arya did the exact same thing to uh, a couple of Frey's sons as the rat cook did to uh, the king's son, evidently. You know, cut him up, put him in a pie, made Frey eat it, and then killed him. Now, again, I'm not certain that there were any guest rights involved. So is Arya's, in the eyes of the gods, is Arya's crime as sinister? I don't know. But I do love how this kind of foretells what Arya will end up doing at the uh, end of season six, beginning of season seven. All right, on to number two for my three big things. And actually, this one doesn't seem like a big thing, but to me, it is kind of huge in the fact that Daenerys pretty much gets treated like a goddess when she finally is greeted by the people of Yunkai. Now, obviously, this isn't the first time. I mean, people have been worshipping her ever since she brought dragons into the world, so to speak. Um, you have the Dothraki who followed her, the few that were around. You have Pyat Pri gang at the House of the Undying who worshipped her power to keep the dragons alive, which helped fuel their power you continually will have this kind of worship complex about Danny. Some of the red priests and red priestesses of Essos will start to refer to her as Azor Ahai, the savior for the world. And this kind of relationship of, of how she's almost a deity to some of these lesser peoples is an interesting aspect to her character but is it a good one, is my question. Because we see Daenerys starting to make absolute decisions, especially starting in season four. And we see her start to be curved back from that by Tyrion, um, starting towards the end of season five, and then onward into uh, season seven, of course, season six and season seven. So... Uh, it's not that she hasn't grown. It's just that I feel like these kinds of things that happen to Danny at this age or back when she first birthed the dragons, so to speak, these are the kinds of things that give her the confidence to think absolutely. And some of those absolute thoughts are not necessarily the good ones. That's why Tyrion reminds Danny of her father. That's why. You know, people are constantly giving her counsel why it's not uncommon for people to offer a different viewpoint to what Danny's decision is. And again, I'm not placing judgment on Danny's decisions overall um, because she does listen to her counselors. But once she makes a decision, she knows that that is the decision that she is going to go by. And that's one of those things that can be really interesting and really powerful, but also very dangerous. 
So that's my second big thing. And like I said, it wasn't that big of a thing. Um, I'll try not to make any comments about how it seemed like the uh, finale of a Broadway musical, <laughs> more so than the finale of a fantasy show. I, after I saw this season, and believe me, I was way about, you know, oh, this is the uh, this is the swimming pool great scenes that you have in the 1940s films. It 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 still totally is that. Um, but when I read the book and I saw what was happening there in the book, um, it made me dislike this scene less. And now it seems to have some real character importance to it more so than I realized before. So, you know, we're young, we throw ideas out there or our minds are very direct and whatever, and uh, sometimes more closed than they are open just because our youth tells us that we're the next generation. Not that I was that young five years ago, but nonetheless, uh, (laughs) I I still, I, I had a much more closed mind about this until after I read the experience in the books. And that's not to say that Dave and Dan didn't do a good job with this. Please, TV people, don't say that I'm taking book reader side stuff to this. I'm just saying that that helped expand my mind a little bit, reading it in the book. Um, and it, it's still a, a great scene. You love to see Danny be adored because she is doing good things for now. Well, I went a little, on a little longer about, about number two than I thought I was going to. My number three is, will the real Stannis Baratheon please stand up? Because there are things in these scenes that totally make me fist pump for Stannis. And then I remember about season five. (laughs) And now, looking back on it, you can see that Stannis really kind of always was the person of season five. And I know there are a lot of Stannis fans out there saying, well, we'll you know, we don't know exactly what was going on in Stannis's mind when he was burning his daughter. Well, we didn't know exactly what was going on in Stannis's mind when he decided to burn Gendry, too. Remember, this is the second time that Davos has saved Gendry. He saved him the first time by just using the leeches. And Stannis is now convinced that because Davos has seen her magic and Stannis knows what him and her created with her magic. I mean, Stannis is convinced that magic is the only way to go, and he makes a really good argument for the fact that dragons are magic, and that's what Aegon did. That's a really good argument. It's not one you can argue with. Also, this was the one moment that really made me love Stannis. My enemies have made my kingdom bleed. I will not forget that. I will not forgive that. I will punish them with any arms at my disposal. But when is it a step too far? Here Davos relates. It's like, this is your nephew. And we realize immediately, well, that's a boundary that Stannis has no problem crossing. Then we find out that there is no boundary that Stannis won't cross. He's willing to sacrifice his own daughter. And that just makes you so mad. And then at the same time, you have these great shots, especially during the debate about Gendry, where Stannis is standing there in the middle, contemplating everything. And you have Melisandre sitting on one shoulder. You have Davos sitting on the other shoulder. It's the devil and angel sitting on the shoulder. And yeah, that's kind of cheesy in a way, but it's perfect. But we see Stannis turn to Melisandre's shoulder side way too often to give him any benefit of the doubt anymore as rewatchers as a first time watcher i'm all about giving him the benefit of the doubt but not anymore the really cool thing is is that davos is the only one to ever try to protect shireen even here when stannis asks him how he came to learn to read He doesn't mention Shireen. He doesn't want to get her in trouble. He doesn't want Melisandre coming after him. He tells Stannis that it was Mathos. A complete lie. He lies to his king. Something I don't think we've ever heard Davos really do before. 
And that is where you find that this is the death of Stannis as the king. Now, Davos will continue to help him and continue to follow him right up until the time that Stannis dies, more or less, or at least till Stannis leaves the wall. But I don't think we've ever heard Davos lie to Stannis before. That's huge. It's, it's a kind of a metaphoric sign that Stannis isn't the guy. Anyway, those are my three big things. I've still got uh, some tidbits. I don't really have any more questions this time around, so we'll just go straight to tidbits. 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 And if you do have some questions about this episode that you would like to have addressed in our next feedback podcast, you still got 24 to 36 hours to submit those questions. And uh, I would appreciate it if you did. Send an email to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com, or you can send a tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter, M-A-T-T-S-G-O-T blog on Twitter. But I didn't really come up with any questions for this particular episode, so I'm moving on to my tidbits. And the whole small council scene is where I'll start because it's not just about the king is tired. You know, I mean, Tywin definitely almost kind of comes to Tyrion's defense here, just as he did during Tyrion and Sansa's wedding. In a lot of ways, because he needs Tyrion's mind, even though he seems to hate him, as we find out in this episode. There's a lot of pent-up anger there. Nonetheless, uh, that's not really what the big tidbit takeaway is for me this time around. The big tidbit takeaway is that this is the second time that Tyrion has more or less indirectly threatened the king's life. Now, you put that in context with Cersei and her talk about her children with Tyrion in this episode as well. And it's just two short episodes from here to the Purple Wedding. This is why I think Cersei as a mother, because of her love for Joffrey, is looking for any kind of reasoning behind Joffrey's death. And because she doesn't really like Tyrion that much. The things that he says in terms of towards Joffrey that anybody out in the streets is probably saying, although Bubba and Catfish from the Joffrey of Podcasts, go check them out. They're very funny and they're very good podcasters. Uh, they would tell you that everybody who hates Joffrey is wrong. Just like Cersei would tell you that. The point being is that Cersei's making mental notes of all of these threats that Tyrion is making. And that's why it's easy for her to draw the conclusion, especially with the circumstance of him bringing the chalice to Joffrey. It's easy for her to come to the conclusion that it had to be Tyrion who killed her son. Obviously not the right conclusion. Some people might even question whether it's a sane conclusion. But I can totally see the follow through here. And I love the fact that that scene between Cersei and Tyrion and yet another threat to Joffrey between Tyrion and Joffrey are in the same episode that helps clarify it on a rewatch for me to see exactly why Cersei was so desperate to convict Tyrion, even if that meant tampering with evidence. So uh, that's one thing about this episode that I would classify in tidbits. Another thing, this is the first time we finally get the nickname Reek for Theon. He has become Reek, finally, in name as well as in persona. I mean, that whole kill me thing. Oh, I mean, there was, there's just this point where you just feel like, okay, enough, Dave and Dan. But really, and I've said this all this season, especially on a rewatch, I might even have agreed with people the first time around. In fact, I think I did agree with people when they're just kind of like, okay, let's just let this thing die, Dave and Dan. Let's just get it over with. Um, but this time around, I think you need to see all of these steps to understand this transformation into finally we have a name. And of course, finally we have an answer as to who Ramsey exactly is because Roos tells us right in the beginning of the episode directly. But if you really needed that bit of dialogue between Roos and Walder Frey uh, to figure it out, then, you know, well, you're there now. You're across the finish line. 
Uh, so uh, there's no denying it now. So we have the elevation of two very unlikely people into a position of power. And of course, Roos says that he might go to Winterfell someday. Well, he ends up going to Winterfell, um, you know, at the end of season four, right? So it's not that far away. It's not a might. It's a, it's a win. And speaking of <laughs> Ramsey, coming back to that, of course, the terms given to Balon, and then Yara standing up to Balon in her speech. And man, I was fist pumping and I was all excited. I was like, I can't wait to see Yara versus Ramsey. And actually, the stuff in season four, when it happens, it's a good scene, but it's so disappointing, the ending of it. Yet, because of all of these things we've seen happen to Theon this season, we can totally draw the line between the two points. And see why Theon would not go with Yara. I mean, for all Theon knows, it's some kind of trick. This process was important to see. And while I'm disappointed that Yara couldn't get the job done, and disappointed in the fact that Theon will continue to disappoint Yara in a lot of ways, um, he is there for her when she needs him politically. And that was season six. Was it? Yes, season six. You know, he, he tries to stand for her when she tries to become the, I guess, the queen of the Iron Islands or whatever. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter because it's the end of season seven where the real Theon has perhaps returned. Another small tidbit only took a couple of episodes to find out that Shay was actually wrong in regards to whether Tyrion or Varys were trying to buy her off, right? The telltale should have been the fact that it was diamonds as opposed to gold, because Tyrion always showers everybody with gold, Lannister gold. Why on earth would he use diamonds? Uh, and that seems kind of obvious to me now. It didn't at the time. I was kind of like thinking, oh, well, okay, if Shay says that it was Tyrion, then it must have been Tyrion. And then you get to the Purple Wedding episode, and Tyrion's, she's talking about how Varys tried to buy her off, and he's like, huh? What? And in actuality, Varys was just trying to help out his friend Tyrion. He was doing, as Varys always says, what's good for the realm. Whatever that means. Yes, I want to kill Daenerys because it's good for the realms. Yes, I want to follow Daenerys because it's good for the realm. Varys, who are you? Will the real Varys please stand up? Uh, anyway, one other small tidbit here, uh, and this is a personal note. In the last episode, I think I said something about, or maybe it was an episode prior to that, I, I t tried to recall that there was uh, kind of like an eagle cry or something when John was first getting his drink and that's what might have led Ygritte to John. Well, I watched this episode on HBO Go this time around, and I had the captions on. It was not a call. There was obviously no call. But there was a sound, and the captions called it a wing flap. To me, when I actually heard the audio this time around, I thought it actually sounds more like Ygritte's pulling her bow back than it sounds like a wing flap. But I'll take the wing flap. Um... At any rate, that doesn't define it as an eagle. It could have just been Egret disturbing a bird that was resting or trying to get a worm. So uh, I have no evidence that Orel was still helping Egret at the time, at least not according to the HBO Go version. Not that I'm saying there are different versions out there, but um, whatever. Here's a huge one, not worthy of a big thing, but it's my final tidbit, and that is Sam saying, we didn't build 500 miles of walls 700 feet high to keep men out. Guards the realms, that's plural, of men. I loved this. And that's why it seems so easy to see this debate that is coming now. Of course, in hindsight, you can, but it should have been pretty easy to see uh, the debate building as to whether they should let the wildlings in or not. Stannis defeats the wildlings. He tells them, bend the knee and you can come to this side. But John ultimately says, no, 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 no. Sam more or less is right. 
And I don't know that Sam really convinces John of anything. It just seems that John has the same kind of ideas. They're guarding the realms of men. And he says, we need the wildlings over here. And hopefully they'll fight for us. Don't know if they will, but Thorne ain't having none of it. Alice at Thorne says, nope, knife in your belly, buddy. So this is a good kind of foreshadowing of a debate that will ultimately kill John. Granted, he gets to come back because all of our Azor Highs have to have something magical about them. Danny births things. John comes back. Those are my thoughts. I'm sure I missed a ton of things that you wanted me to talk about. Uh, I probably said too much of things that you didn't want me to talk about. But if you have any thoughts about any of it, once again, feel free to send me an email or a tweet. You have 24 to 36 hours before I record the next feedback podcast, which will be out this Monday. We still have two segments left before we say goodbye. The first one is describing the episode in three words. Hey, you can submit those as well if you wish. But three words is next. Three words. Describing the episode in three words. So, as Axel Foley from the DVR Podcast Network just told you, trying to describe the episode in three words. Oh, by the way, Axel's a great guy. He's running a great network over there. I am so thankful to the DVR Podcast Network for keeping Podcast Wonderful alive when I had to abandon it. Um, they're doing a great job. They're looking at things in different ways, and they don't put a whole lot of episodes out during the off-seasons, but when they do, they're usually good, good episodes, so be sure to check them out. And uh, also, just in general, the DVR Podcast Network is is really a cool place worth lots of cool pods so um, check them out this is not a paid advertisement i just they're friends of mine all of them um, they've given me plenty of trouble over the years because of my crazy crackpot emotions i don't really have great crackpot theories like some of them do but i do have great crackpot emotions and they've sometimes kept me in check sometimes they've enraged me and uh that's always good for good listening, if, if you like hearing me lose my cool, that, that always helps as well, um, if that's what you're into, I mean. Also, I, I just want to say, once again, on regular podcasts through regular podcast apps, you're going to get a lot more music than you would say on our YouTube page. And by the way, you can find the link to our YouTube page at mattsaudioblog.com. That's not the point. The point is, is that in these show notes that accompany each episode, I list the music that I play. And it's very important to me that you just look at the show notes. You don't have to click on any links. You don't have to buy anything. Please just say, oh yeah, that guy did that music. Or, oh, oh yeah, that person did that music. And that way I know I've done my job to help my fellow musicians. Also want to say this, uh, those guys did invite me to come back to podcast Winterfell. I, they'd done such a great job on their own that I didn't feel like the podcast was mine anymore and it's become more theirs and they're doing a great job with it. So once again, uh, what's her Twitter handle? Oh, I remember at Winterfell pod on Twitter, follow them there. And from there you can find the DVR podcast network and all of this stuff that they're doing over there as well. Wow. That was a lot of stalling to get to my three words. Wasn't it? Turn the page. Those are my three words. We're closing a lot of chapters. We're opening a lot of new ones. We now have Walder Frey as basically the Lord of the Riverlands. We have Roose Bolton as the Warden of the North. We have a whole lot of changes. Arya now, the last person that she'll see that she really knows is the Hound. Until she leaves for Bravos. I'm going to get more to Arya in my brothel mates, promise you, because I haven't talked a whole lot about her yet. Um, so th there's lots of pages that are being turned in a lot of ways. Chapters that are closing, new chapters that will open in season four. Sansa's whole life will change in season four. Every character's life will change significantly in season four in a lot of ways. Um, Arya is actually doesn't change all that much, but it comes to a big change at the end of season four. Turn the page. Cheesy? Yes. Too meta? Yeah, probably. But if you can come up with better ones, 
You still have, what, 24 hours or so? Uh, 23 to 35 hours, now that I've talked for more than an hour in this podcast, you have that long to get me yours. Send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com, or you can tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter. That's M-A-T-T-S G-O-T blog on Twitter. And we have one last segment before we say goodbye for this episode and to this season and that is the brothel mates of the episode. That's the best coupling of the episode. That's next. Brothel mates of the episode. The best coupling of the episode. Now, you all thought that I forgot about talking about Arya and her big moment at the end of this episode. I'm sure you thought that as soon as I wrapped up my tidbits. It's like, where's the Arya talk? He's always talking about Arya being his favorite character. And he's always talking about how concerned he is for the way she's turned. Well, my... Brothel mates for this episode will pretty much touch on that. I just do want to say that if you want to come up with your own brothel mates, it does not have to be two people, mine this time or not. It can be a person and a concept or a person and an emotion or a person and anything. Or it can be two people. For me this time around, it is Aria and Vengeance. Valamukula, she whispers. And... That was creepy, man. I mean, it was just like, ooh, something inside Arya's head just clicked. Something turned. A key was unlocking something that we'd not really seen to the extreme that we saw this time around. She did have her list. The Hound had already confronted her in this season about her list. She still got her list, but now we kind of see what she's going to do with that list and how violently she's going to be. And boy, was she convincing to be the poor, helpless little girl before she started just stabbing that guy in the neck. It's dark. It's disturbing. It's the most disturbing we've seen Arya be up to this point. Now, We've seen the telltale signs of what causes this point. But yeah, the Red Wedding, that's what totally flipped the switch. And her whole journey is no longer about family. She doesn't have any left as far as she knows, really. Maybe Sansa. But, I mean, it, it's just, it is sad. I love Arya. I never wanted Arya to have to go to this length. I didn't want Arya to become... <laughs> the henchman for the fans in a way but at the same time it is a very interesting character journey is it not and with that that is my brothel mates it is aria and vengeance if you have brothel mates send them to me again you have what 23 to 35 hours left to do so if you've been listening to this podcast since it was first released uh, give or take you know I'm pretty flexible, actually. So uh, get them into me as quick as you can. And if not, I'll save them for the next feedback podcast. I mean, if you miss the deadline, so what? I'm fashionably late, right? I'll put it in the next one. I just don't want you to feel deterred from having your own thoughts about any of this stuff and telling me how wrong I am. Or <laughs> in the rare occasion, you might even agree with me. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. Remember mattsaudioblog.com for all things this podcast. And if you have thoughts, you still have a little bit of time left and get it into me uh, within the next 36 hours, more or less. And I will try and include it in the feedback podcast. That'll be out on Monday. And then we have season four starting next Thursday, a week from today. And lots of surprises for you all in Season 4. Hopefully, mostly pleasant ones. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>